All right, welcome to the Front Row Podcast. This is Mark Godfrey. I'm having a ball with my uh, new podcast, and uh, I'm having fun. And uh, I'm really, really excited for a lot of different reasons today because my guest, uh, Connor Garnett, uh, is ranked, I think, currently, if I get this wrong, uh, correct me, but I think you're ranked number four currently in the world in pickleball, which uh, I know a lot of people... Uh, maybe aren't as familiar with pickleball, but there's also this other group that's just on fire for pickleball. So first of all, thank you for joining me. I'm excited. This is because uh, I'm a pickleball guy now. I've caught the bug, but uh, I'm excited to have you on. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Uh, four in singles. Devil's ranking is coming along, but it's not there yet. So moving up. But yeah, it's crazy. Pickleball has just been taken off and so many people are just getting into the sport and just getting addicted, which is awesome to see. So let's go back because uh, I'm, I'm always interested in this and I'm always because uh, there's a lot of young people that, that listen and I think will listen and I think they'll listen to you. I think there will be a lot of interest in, in, in hearing your story. But uh, growing up just outside of Seattle, yep. uh, Bellevue and uh, high school tennis player. How old were you when you started playing tennis? My parents. So we had a sports court in our backyard. So I kind of was always like goofing around with a racket, but. I think I got into tennis when I was about six or seven and mm -hmm. then just really liked it. It's cool because a lot of people like you have those like tennis parents that like force their kids into tennis. But for my family, like I was kind of the catalyst, like my dad and mom played a little bit, but I got into it and then they kind of got into it. So it was a cool thing we could do as a family to play together as opposed to them pushing this onto me, which was awesome. So you grow up, and uh, one thing I thought was uh, pretty impressive, and again, being a guy who's been involved in sports my whole life, and my children have been involved in sports, uh, through your high school tennis career, three straight state championships mm -hmm. as a single, single yep. player. And the most impressive thing is undefeated, never lost, <laughs> never lost a match. I don't know how many people can say that, that they played a sport through high school <laughs> and never lost. What was that like? Yeah, no, it was uh, it was pretty cool. Tennis is a little different where not everyone hops into high school tennis. So you still have those tournaments that are going around the country. But it was you still had some good competition. And I think my senior year, I was playing a buddy of mine, Jared, and he got the first set off me. So I was close to losing that match. And I was thinking there was a lot of pressure on it. But it was fun. And I mean, awesome to play a sport for your high school and just be able to go to state and play with everyone. So then after high school, uh, you had a phenomenal career there, and uh, you end up uh, playing tennis for Santa Clara University. Tell me about that. How would you like it at Santa Clara? Yeah, no, loved it at Santa Clara. It's nice. One of the things about Santa Clara is it's a little smaller school, so we didn't have football, which unfortunately means no tailgating, but it means that you're a little bit bigger of a fish in the athlete pond. So I was able to play tennis. I was able to get involved in a lot of the student athletics side of things, and you got to know everyone there and it was a small Jesuit school, which was pretty awesome. And it was a great time and I wouldn't really trade it for any bigger school. Tell, tell me about uh, your experience after college when you end up at uh, the University of Nottingham. How, how did that happen? I'm reading about that going, mm -hmm. what? wait a minute, University of Nottingham. And did you play tennis there as well? So how, yeah. did, how does that come about? Yeah. So my head coach at Santa Clara, he was British. And so he knew a few people over there and the conversation kind of got brought up casually about like these opportunities. And I was looking at working in investment banking. So I had missed like the recruiting cycle for that. And I wasn't really done playing tennis. I still wanted to play a little more. So went over there, basically got a little bit of scholarship, was able to still work towards a degree. So I was in that cycle for a job, but then I also got to go travel around Europe, playing some tennis tournaments, just exploring. And so, really wanted to make sure I had another year that I could play tennis and have fun before I got into the real world. And so with tennis, uh, Connor, <clears throat> it's interesting because, uh, you know, you, you eventually transition from tennis to pickleball. And that's what we're going to get mm -hmm. to in a second. But just kind of that, that period where you're post-college, um, I think you were uh, kind of, a, if I say this correctly, hitting mm -hmm. partner with uh, Jokovic, yep. probably one of the one, two, three best players maybe of all time. Yeah. And so you're, you're learning a lot. So was part of it for you, like, I still want to be a pro in tennis or tell me at what point it kind of transitioned from tennis, 
into pickleball because that's an interesting thing there. Yeah, so I would say when I was in Nottingham, I was playing all the future, like trying to play a few futures tournaments and COVID hit. So all those got shut down. And so I needed to find a job, make some money. And so got the job at investment banking lined up. And when I was doing that, it was enough hours where I wasn't at the level I was in college of playing tennis. So it felt like I was chasing what I once was. And then once pickleball kind of came around when I was working, I was able to get better quickly. And because it's a new sport, I'm able to constantly improve as opposed to chasing that what college tennis version of myself. And that just, I love that. I'm always trying to be learning. And so that presented an opportunity where I can go play tournaments, feel like I'm improving, and then see how I stack up against the competition. So here, here's a thought, and I want you to talk about this. So um, mm-hmm. you and I shook hands for the first time about 30 minutes ago, and I got yeah. to know you. But in a, in a quick 30 minute prior to us starting to, to shoot the, the podcast here, one thing I could pull real quickly from you is there's a competitive side of you <laughs> that mm-hmm. I think I think high achievers, all of us, you know, and I was able to coach at a high level and I was drafted by the mm-hmm. Detroit Pistons years ago. And and uh, but a lot of my friends played basketball at a high, high level. And uh, but there's something about this competitive. I, I don't know if it's innate mm-hmm. or if it's taught. But I can see with you, you have this amazing competitive spirit like you know, if I said, well, you're six, well, I'm actually fourth, you know, and, and that's mm-hmm. good. I, I like that. See, to me, mm-hmm. that, that, that's incur- that's inspiring for me, mm-hmm. but where for you, like that competitive, like I, you're going to be number one in the world mm-hmm. in pickleball. I believe that. I believe that yeah. with all my heart. I've watched you. I don't know enough about it, but I've watched you and then talked to you, but where does all that kind of t- tell me where you think you get that from? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think I've thought about that too much before, but I would say, I was a little bit of that's just kind of born with it. And there's like a stubbornness that I think I have. Just if you talk to any of my friends, like if I think I'm right about something, like (laughs) I will fight, like I'll admit if I'm wrong, if you prove that I'm wrong, like I'll get out there and be like, you're right. But until you bring in the facts, like I'm going to fight tooth and nail for something. And I think it's just kind of like my mantra is like, there's no point in doing something if you're not going to give it your all. And so I try and apply that. And I'd say I'm pretty critical of myself as well. So having that critical, like reflectiveness is super key to having that competitive spirit. I think, do you think at some point, I don't know if parents or coach or friends, and I give you an example, Connor, when I was Mm -hmm. very young, my dad was a small college, uh, basketball coach and we put a basketball hoop up in our garage. We Mm -hmm. had actually had a full court, believe it or not, on both sides of the garage. And I was young. Mm -hmm. But he would never let me win. I mean, he would <laughs> slam me into the wall. I mean, you know, and he'd kind of let me get close where I thought I had a chance to win. Then he beat me. And I remember as like a, you know, fourth or fifth grader, because I remember the house we lived in. But I remember heading right to my bedroom and I'd just go in there and cry. <laughs> I'd just cry in my bedroom like mm-hmm. I can't beat him anymore. And mm-hmm. I maybe I look back and say, that might have somehow shaped me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Were there anything like that for you growing up? That, that competitive part that uh, kind of harnesses in there for you. I don't know. Was there anything like that ever with you in any experiences you had? Yeah. So I don't think I've actually talked about this in pickleball, but my coach, first tennis coach, he was a former boxer. So tough guy, tough as nails. Uh, he's kind of mellowed out over the years. So if he's listening, I'm sure that's going <laughs> to bug him a little bit, but we said it. Uh, and so he was, I was an only child. So I was arguably a little soft as a kid. And I started going to him when I was about 10 and he would just get on me. Like he was very fair about it, but he would, if you're not putting in the work, if you're not, if you're losing, like we had a thing where if you lost six zero in tennis, you had to run 10,000 10, sprints and you had to do it that week. And so there were all these things like that where he, the punishments were like butts up on the court. Now I don't think it's allowed uh, for a tennis coach to have their students serve at you if you lose, but all of these little games were just very competitive, very like just getting you tough. And the probably the one story was that I'll never forget. I was at my buddy's house. It was like a summer day and we're just chilling there. I get a text from him. He's like, you got a lesson in an hour. He lived like two doors down from my buddy. And I'm on the court now thinking I was just gonna have a chill day, like go on the water. 
and I can't hit a forehand approach shot in tennis. And he's just yelling at me. Like every time I miss it's 10 push ups. the court's hot. So it's like almost hurting my hands. And it's like those moments where looking back, like that definitely shaped me. And like, mm -hmm. he was always fair about it. So I was never, nothing he did felt unjustified. And it was a really good way where like all of that stuff shaped me and made me a lot tougher. And I can kind of see when I'm talking to people who have gone through like maybe it's having siblings or gone through a sports experience where they had a coach that was tough on them. They just are able to kind of be a little more competitive, handle life a little bit more, be able to get yelled at and not like lose their mind. So I think that definitely was a huge part in my upbringing and one of the things that built in that resiliency and competitive edge today. Well, it obviously made a difference and uh, and some of it probably is innate, but you have had people like that. We all have where mm -hmm. they, you know, they, it's something about it that like, I'll never forget, uh, like my dad, you know, he, he just, he, he, and his brother, my uncle, I mean, they'd beat the living snot out of me in the garage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, my mom would always say, oh, you guys need to be light on him, you know, <laughs> let him win every now and they'd mm -hmm. be like, nope, he yeah. doesn't get to win. And then finally about ninth or 10th grade, I passed him. And yeah. Then at that point, I got a little taller, a little bigger, and he couldn't beat me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was my turn now. Yeah. <laughs> but that kind of thing, I think, makes it makes 100%. us all better. And yeah. I think, too, especially in society now, I, I do think this is another topic for another day, but this generation kind of young people, there's there's a softness right now that uh, I don't really like it. it it's uh, there, there needs to be more toughness, I think. I don't know, I don't yeah. know how you respond to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely, everyone responds to things a little differently, but I really appreciate my experience and I think you can definitely tell who has that kind of side of it and for me I think it goes about just daily life better and right yeah so pickleball is probably uh, I've read probably one of the fastest growing sports probably in the world and it's interesting uh full disclosure I play about six days a week now i mean i've got the pickleball bug you know and, and i've gotten better i'm nowhere near obviously you guys but i've improved from a beginner to where i'm competitive but i've run into people that play all over i, I met a guy that uh, lives uh in the cayman islands who just built a complex with 20 courts and he's from new zealand and mm -hmm. you know he's making money i went to columbus ohio and played and a guy converted a farm farmland into eight indoor pickleball courts and so mm -hmm. you're catching the sport um kind of at the right time when it's new. So how do you kind of see pickleball globally, worldwide? It is, it is, it's coming. I mean, people are playing, people are interested and, uh, and you're a big part of it because you're promoting the sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's awesome. There's a lot of engagement right now and you see it's in its infancy. So you see like a lot of kind of chaos and there's a lot of drama with it too. But as it continues to develop, it's going to start to get structured, get everything, kind of everyone's ducks in a row. And it's, it's a pretty exciting time because there's so much opportunity. Everyone's coming in. You have a lot of very cool people throwing money into the sport. I mean, you look at all the celebrity owners of teams. I mean, LeBron's in it. Like the other week, Jeremy Lin is one of my team owners for the Bay Area Breakers, like got to meet him, which was super cool. And so being able to kind of have this mass adoption at every level of society is really promising for the sport. And for the sport now, which it's, it's kind of went from, I think people have been playing it for a long time, but in the last handful of years, it's kind of taken this massive step and people are interested and there's popularity with it and mm -hmm. it's all over the place. Yep. What do you think, uh, Connor, like from where it is right now, and let, let me kind of ask you this way, this question is, um, and we talked about this earlier, you know, I, I grew up watching boxing. I was a boxing fanatic. I watched Joe Frazier and George Foreman, Muhammad Ali, and then it was Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield and the heavyweights. And then you mm -hmm. had the, you had the uh, Sugar Ray uh, Leonard's and you had all those guys. But television then, especially ESPN with Dana White in the UFC, they kind of took it over a little bit. They're still boxing. Deontay mm -hmm. Wilder is a good friend of mine who's probably the heavy, was the heavyweight champ. But television changed the game for the UFC. Now you have people that are pay-per-view, they're watching, they're into it, you know, they're, they're young generation. So for you, like to get pickleball from where it is now to the next big step, what do you think, if I just said, what, what do you think has to happen? 
Yeah, I mean, getting eyeballs on the sport is the key. And so it sounds like boxing kind of did it with those big TV deals. And pickleball is probably in a stage where there isn't that want for viewership yet. And so it's just getting it in front of people in a different way. Like I think when they had some stuff on Amazon Prime, it was super successful. And you kind of mentioned earlier too, like the next generations are definitely going to be more inclined if it starts getting on TV now. And so it's just setting up that stage for people to watch it, getting it organized and just having a kind of a platform where people are like, oh, pickleball is going to be here. Now we can watch it and having more pros get into it, having academies for young kids, like all of this stuff is going to start to kind of combine. And now you're going to get a lot more eyeballs on pickleball. This will be a crazy question I'm going to ask you, but um, this is an interesting one for me because even in the neighborhood I live in, we have three tennis courts that are never used. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to convince our HOA to convert one of them to pickleball. Me and yeah. everybody else around <laughs> America, eh, let's change this tennis court to pickleball. But one thing they say is the noise yeah. because the ball, you know, the paddle, the ball. And so do you foresee at any point in time, I know this is kind of an interesting question, but Will they ever address that and say, okay, there's a way to do the paddles or the balls where they're not loud? Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen a little bit of like paddle technology that has tried to do that. I by no means know the ins and outs of all the kind of mechanics on a paddle that would be required to do that. With everything, there's a lot of rules on what a paddle can be. So it would be tough in the near term to do that. But with new pickleballs, new paddles, I could see that definitely being something that maybe on the non-pro side is there and allows people to play pickleball in their local neighborhoods a lot easier. Are there are there are the tournaments now that you play in? Let's just say in the last year or two. Let's say year, mm -hmm. one yeah. year, uh, like prize money. Um, is it beginning to creep up a little bit? You're getting more sponsors involved. You're getting more people that are put, putting into the sport. So is there an opportunity? for guys like yourself to start to, to advance and make a little bit more money than maybe, let's say, a few years ago? Yeah, no, 100%. I got into the sport probably a year ago. And so before that, there wasn't enough money to really make a living out of pickleball. And so I was fortunate on the timing where I got into it. I was constantly battling between like investment banking, which is what I was doing in pickleball. And I waited until the last possible moment, which was January of this year, where I knew I could at least break even traveling to all these tournaments. And then since January, there's been a lot of inflow of money. And now the top players are making good money. And even the kind of middle players are making a decent living. So it's really drastically increased over the last year. Talk about the leadership of the sport. Like, let's say your, uh, your professional league is called the pickleball. What is it called? Yeah, so there's two, two leagues that they merged, uh, MLP and PPA. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is a little bit of kind of a split that now they merged back together, which is awesome for the mm -hmm. sport. And so they, the PPA kind of runs a lot of the individual tournaments. And then the MLP runs the team events with all the celebrity owners. And it really does a good job of kind of the team events make pickleball super exciting to watch. You have team chemistry, the matches are closer, and then the PPA runs those individual tournaments, which are a little bit more like tennis and you have like a team that's a clear winner and all this stuff. And so it takes a new approach to it and having both of those now kind of working together is super exciting for the sport. Is the leadership, I don't want to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. though, because of the leadership, because I look in sports, if you look at, uh, let's say, college athletics, yeah. and you take a conference commissioner, mm -hmm. SEC conference commissioner, the ACC conference commissioner, those guys or gals, they have to be really good at, you know, understanding the market to to get a TV contract. I mean, that that's really mm -hmm. where it is, because yeah. at that point then, that's why UCLA and USC – left the Pac-12 yep. to go to the Big Ten. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more money. They're, they're going to double their annual budget, uh, athletic department, television revenue budget, and mm -hmm. because they bring the Los Angeles market, all that kind yeah. of stuff. But the leadership in pickleball, I guess, there's a little – not I wouldn't say pressure, but there has to be some pressure to be good enough to take a sport that right now is on fire – 
and capitalize it on in a way where you can end up with a television contract. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think pickleball right now is in its infancy, so they're still learning all of that. And uh, I guess the leadership has gotten us to a point where now there are more eyeballs on it. And I guess it's now on them to continue doing that. And it's probably, I mean, some of them do have that experience. So it'll be interesting to see if they're able to capitalize on it and really propel that sport to the next level. But I think with that merge, that was definitely one of the focuses. Now everyone can be on the same page, share knowledge and bring pickleball to that next level of viewership on some of these TV stations and whatnot. Well, I think that's where the money is. I mean, if yeah. you look right now, like for me, I have direct TV at my house. I go right right now through the, and I got the NFL network. I got MLB network. I have a tennis channel. I have mm -hmm. a golf channel. I want a pickleball channel. That's me. Yeah. Like I want one. I, mm -hmm. I want to go to that and I want to watch guys like yourself. Yeah. You know, and there's a tennis fanatic too, but I, mm. me personally, I want to watch that more than I want to watch the tennis channel right yeah. now. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of pickleball going on tennis channel, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that'll be interesting to see. And I think they've done a good job of getting it on TV. There was one of my matches was on ESPN against Ben, which was pretty cool. So they're starting to bridge that gap, but now it's showing that people want to watch pickleball on these bigger channels. And that's going to be kind of the next hurdle. So let me go backwards. I mean, I'm going to go back to another question. So I'm going to give you a reference point, and then I want you to respond a little bit. So mm -hmm. if you go back, and they did this a few years ago when the, the Chicago Bulls had the great show on television, The Last Dance, and they went through the Bulls and how they kind of got to the point where they won all the championships, and Jordan Pippen and Phil Jackson. Yep. But part of that was, and a couple of these guys are pretty good friends of mine, which is interesting, but part of that was like Michael Jordan had he struggled for years to get past the Detroit Pistons in the Eastern Conference in basketball in the yeah. NBA. And he finally kind of, when they finally got over that hurdle, then it was ready to potentially become, you know, world champs and win an yeah. NBA championships. All right. So for you mm -hmm. right now, for you, yeah. as competitive as you are, <laughs> is there a guy that you're looking at that's you say, I got to get past that dude. Like that dude, okay, he's a hair ahead of me right now. Maybe he's been playing longer than mm -hmm. you. Like maybe he's had, you know, you're, you've been really kind of doing this for a year, but I got to get over that hump. What, what is that for you? Like what's that hump to get over? Yeah, I think how I would kind of look at it, it's not necessarily a player. Like I think there are a couple players that come to mind, but it's getting that first kind of, gold medal in a PPA tournament. And so once I get that, I've kind of come up short in a couple finals. And the last final, I was pretty, pretty upset with myself because I felt like I played tight. And so it's kind of getting that first one and it feels like that will kind of trickle into the rest. And so it's, it's uh, that the way pickleball is set up is basically the final is on a completely different day. So you play all of your singles on Thursday all of your mixed on Friday, all your gender doubles on Saturday, and then Sunday are all the final matches. And so it's a completely different environment. All the fans are there. And so getting that first kind of PPA title, I think, is that next step where I just need to lock it down, get it done. And then that kind of makes it easier going forward once you've been there, once you've been able to do that. And your goal as a pickleball pro, you're mm -hmm. a professional pickleball player, your goal is to do what? To be what? To win. I mean, I, it's, it's interesting. Like, there's the format of pickleball. Some people, like, it used to have, like, a double elimination. Now it's single elimination where if you lose in the first round, you can go into a back draw or something like that. But I, my only goal is to win tournaments and hopefully with that become number one. And so... Uh, you see a lot of different types of people in pickleball right now. And there's some that are there for more like just the fun of it. But now you're kind of getting this new wave of people now that the money's coming in that are there just to win. And it's pretty exciting. So if you go back, like, let's go back to Michael Jordan. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there was a point probably with him where he was obviously very talented, very good. You know, he's getting 63 points in a playoff game against the Celtics. But 
he realizes for me to get to the next level, I've got to get bigger and stronger. I've got to get stronger. I've got to be able to withstand, you know, back then, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't remember the Pistons were the bad boys and they were brutal and they were banging and knocking everybody down. And you know, that's just the way they played. Yeah. But for him, it was that. Is there something like that for you where you say, okay, I'm, I'm ranked fourth in the world right now. I'm mm -hmm. one of the top five players, yeah. arguably up there. Nobody mm -hmm. can argue that. But for me to get from there to, to being number one, is there one or two things for you that you say, man, I've got to get better at this? What would that be? Film. Uh, a lot of those top guys right now on the single side, like you look at like a Ben or a Tyson, they watch film. They are students of the game. And for my journey, it hasn't been as important to do that yet, just because I'm getting the feel of the strokes, getting used to all the shots and spending most of my time on the court. And now I've kind of come to a point where I need to be in the, in the room with the TV on, watching these guys, taking notes on what their style is, where I think their weaknesses are, and just have that. Because if you're not really doing that extra work, those people that are are going to find those holes in your game and you're more playing defense as, a bit, as opposed to being proactive on it. Is in, in your sport, would, would you rely on kind of a mentor? Because your sport is so new. It's, it's an interesting, um, you know, kind mm. of dichotomy, I guess is the right word. But it's such a, a new thing that, you know, if I'm, if I'm uh, Kobe, I'm relying on Jordan. If I'm, you know, this guy, mm -hmm. you know, I'm privately I'm calling that guy saying, okay, help me here I, I you know I'm really good but I I, I want to get that next step is in I mean does that kind of pertain with you like a mentor coach or is most of that just kind of by yourself most of that currently is by myself uh tennis is a pretty interesting parallel you'll see I think it's probably the top 50 guys have coaches and so you see this disparity in tennis where those people outside of that aren't as savvy on the court because they don't have someone just giving them all the information. And so pickleball doesn't really have coaches yet, but that's gonna be a big element when you have someone there to provide that second opinion and be able to discuss that with you, you're gonna to start to see those people, I think, start to separate themselves from the pack. So when I watch you play just on film, and I wanna watch you in person too coming up, but when I watch you play, first of all, you're, you're fun to watch and I, and I enjoy it, but what I like is, or what's interesting to me is, and, and I'm a beginner, you know, I'm a, I'm a newbie to, the, to this whole deal. But uh, the, the transition from tennis to pickleball for you, and you bring a two-handed backhand into pickleball, which, I don't know, maybe there's a lot of people, but I haven't seen a lot of people mm -hmm. doing it. I think you're a little bit unique in that. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say just the the way I hit my two-handed backhand is very aggressive and most people aren't as ambitious with it. And so that just kind of naturally came from tennis. I didn't know any better. So it's like when you go in not knowing what the quote-unquote limitations are for something, then the sky is the limit. And that's what I've started to do. And one of the shots that I hit probably better than most is the around the post. And so... Now you'll see a few other guys, like, because I've shown it's possible, I watched, I was watching the finals of MLP, and you have a lot more around the post now, so it's, it's this kind of changing of the mindset where now a lot more things are possible, and once someone starts doing it, it kind of opens everyone's eyes to it. It's really, it's really an amazing, and for a lot of people that might be watching or listening to this, the around the post, explain it to the, I don't want to try to explain. I mean, I know what it is, but <laughs> mm -hmm. it, you ex explain that to the, to the common newbie that's just learning or watching. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so the pickleball court, the net is, it's a little smaller than a tennis net. So the ball doesn't have to go over the net. It just can't hit the net. So if you get pulled wide enough, you can hit the ball. And as long as it still lands on the other side, it can go around to the side of the post as opposed to having to go over the net. So as long as you get it to that other side, it doesn't really matter how it gets there. Can, can you put with your either your forehand or backhand, can you go around the net and put enough spin on it to where it almost goes around the net and still ends up in? Are you, are you good at that? Yeah, so that the backhand side, that's where that's kind of my shot. And you'll start to see people spinning theirs now just because of that. Forehand side, still a little work in progress, but it's just some of these angles, you'll see the pros they don't even think it's possible. 
And now with paddle technology and everything, it's starting to get there. And now people are covering it more. And it's just, it's interesting. It's the game's kind of changing with that a little bit. So you got a, a gazillion newbies out there that are playing pickleball. I mean, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable to me. And I, I tell people all the time, and I'll play here in, you know, Newport Beach area. And, uh, you know, I've gone over to UC Irvine. There's four pickleball courts. There'll be 25 or 30 people kind of rotating through on four courts. And then beside us, you look over there, there's 10 tennis courts, and they're all empty. There's not a, there's not a body on them. And yeah. in pickleball, there's 25 people. Or if I go over here to Benita Canyon, there's, you know, 25, 30 people. And then you look down the hill, there's a tennis court, and there might be two people playing. Mm -hmm. So it's everybody. So you got a lot of people playing. You got a ton of new people playing. Now, you, you're, you, you walked into the sport advanced because you played tennis and obviously very good in college tennis player. So you, you had to transition different. But learning to dink the ball, which is just barely putting it over, like – if you were coaching uh, a, a new person, give me one or two or three things that you might say, you know what, just as you're beginning, start with this, this, and this. What would they be? Yeah, so I think the, the first one's going to come from a tennis perspective. So if you do have a tennis background, shorten everything. Uh, in pickleball, everything is a very short swing. So the less motion you can have, the better it's going to be. A lot of people think in racket sports, the more you can swing your arm, the better the shot is, but it's the exact opposite. I would say a couple other things are just the more you can get your lower body involved. The kinetic chain is so important in any sport. You can make an, an analogy to most every sport with the legs and the lower body are what give you the power. And so the more you can think about that, that's going to be super helpful. And then just putting in the hours of practice, really getting comfortable at all the different spots on the court. Those are, those are amazing things. So in your sport right now, because it's happening all over, and you and I have talked a little bit about this prior to uh, we started filming, but um, the whole influencer, um, social media, people playing, um, people are beginning to make a lot of money or, mm -hmm. or some money yeah. as uh, pickleball players through being an influencer. Tell me how that has kind of shaped and changed a little bit, maybe even the way you think of things and your whole approach with social media and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, the influencer side is very interesting. I mean, I think I heard someone say this year that like influencers are going to go away just because everyone's an influencer now. So it's like kind of redefining how we think about social media, but you can make a lot of money. I mean, if you're drawing eyeballs to the sport, people want to pay you. So there's some people that aren't as good, but have a huge following that are getting, getting paid to do that. And so you got to find that balance of where do you spend your time? Is it more important to grow your following? Is it more important to get better at pickleball? Like there's a trade-off, obviously you don't want to do just one, but finding that right balance is super important because at the end of the day, if I have 20 followers on Instagram, I'm probably not getting a good paddle deal, but that being said, I could still get a decent one because of my style of play and I'm getting on the PPA or MLPs Instagrams. And so it's that balance of the two that you got to find. And I'll say it cause you can't say, it, but plus, you know, if you're a, a smoking hot chick or something, you can play, you're probably gonna have a lot of followers and you're probably going to end up with a little bit more money and it's just yep. the way of the world. It's yeah. just how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. You got to play to your strengths and figure out where, what, you can bring into the sport and where you can add value. And if you're getting eyeballs on the sport through any means, like people are going to want to pay for that. And they do. And yeah. they do in, in all walks of life and it's happening. So here's another uh, thought I, w I had with you coming, uh, coming in today. And I look at uh, Paris in 2024, got the Olympics coming up in Paris, 2028, the Olympics are in LA yep. right here in Los Angeles. Do you think at any point in time pickleball can gain enough traction all around the world or enough places around the world to where pickleball, because really if you look at the Olympics now, there's some really unusual sports that I don't think are nearly as popular as pickleball, but they're, they're, they're almost bringing in sports kind of as trial a little bit. Let's try this and see what kind. Has there ever been any discussion or do you, are you aware or, or you know, what's your thought on that as far as Olympics? Yeah, and I might butcher some of the facts here, but pickleball was definitely talked about in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a way, like there are certain sports that are kind of like, quote unquote, like trial 
sports. And so you have to like petition to get that sport in. And like they have a budget of X amount of sports in each Olympics that can go in through this. And so there's been talk of trying to get pickleball in under that uh, kind of umbrella. I don't know how successful that's been. It didn't sound like 2028 would happen, but I mean, hopefully there will be something like that. It'll just be interesting because all of the pros right now are 70, 80% play under the American flag. So if you're from another country and looking to get into pickleball, like pretty cool way to get to the Olympics, pick up pickleball. And it's happening. I yeah. mean, I think it's kind of people I've talked to all over the world. They're, now, there may not be as popular as in the U.S., but people mm -hmm. are playing. Yeah. And they're playing everywhere. And uh, it's becoming I, – I, I don't know of a sport in my lifetime that I've seen have this jump the way pickleball has had in the mm -hmm. last probably maybe five years. Yeah. I, I've never seen anything like it in any sport. You know, I played racquetball when I was young, and it was a great, fun sport to go mm -hmm. play. But I never really saw – you know, racquetball, you got to rent a court, you got to find a court, you got to get inside, you know, all that. Where pickleball, it's a little bit easier for people to pick up. You, I think, you know, and you, you might disagree, you can get from a complete beginner to being able to play and have fun playing way quicker than you can in most sports. Yep. Obviously, to get from where, you know, to be to where you are, and, you know, there, that's a whole nother. That's like anything in the world. The elite level is always, that's a whole nother level. But the common athletic person can play. Yeah. And they can go play. And so it just – and I'm always wondering, the Olympics and different things like that, or maybe is that in the future for pickleball? I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, it would be really cool to see it in the Olympics. And just uh, when I was in investment banking, I would always joke with some of my buddies. It's like, how do I get into the Olympics? And whether it's like you hear the stories of like a coxswain, like you don't have to be that good to be like that. So it's like finding those ways where now all of a sudden a new – group of people can get into the Olympics. I think that would be tremendous for the sport would bring a lot of people into it. I mean, the Olympics is such a prestigious like event that it would only bring a lot more eyeballs to the sport and could really kickstart even more growth in pickleball. Do you think there could ever be a time where you could take some of the big names of tennis who are mm -hmm. now older, just like the senior tour in golf? You know, yeah. and I've played with a lot of these guys, you know, Lee Trevino and Chi Chi Rodriguez and all these guys. And, but, but even not those guys, but now at, at age 50, you're talking about some pretty good golfers yep. that play on the senior tour mm -hmm. because they can't hit the ball as far as the 20 year old or Bryson DeChambeau or some of these guys. They just can't, you know, in a four day Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but give them three days competing against one another. And there's a real interest in the seniors. So, like with pickleball, do you think there's ever an opportunity for the guys, and I don't know who they are, I'm just going to throw some names out, the Andre Agassiz or whomever, mm -hmm. that maybe can't compete on a tennis level with the best, but pickleball, they can draw, they're going to draw people in because of their stature. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Andre uh, and a few others, I think Michael Chang, uh, McEnroe, and it might have been Sampras, I could be wrong on that, did a pickleball exhibition. And I think that's the most viewed pickleball event so far. So there's a lot of value to bringing in these tennis players. You have Jack Sock coming in, you have Jeannie Bouchard, you have a couple other tennis players getting into the sport. And so it's not a one-to-one -one transition where if you're good at tennis, you're going to be good at pickleball, but there are similarities. So having these people come into the sport, even if they're not going to be winning right away or even if they aren't able to figure out pickleball which I bet they will but just regardless they're bringing in eyeballs from mm -hmm. another sport they're big names in what they've done and it's only going to bring in more people make it more of a mainstream sport which is super exciting to see I think I think you're right I, I would watch it I mean I I, I missed that one but I would I, I actually go back and try to watch mm -hmm. it because it'd be interesting just for me to see how those guys transition so. Yeah, yeah, and you see like very different styles of tennis players. Typically, the bigger servers aren't don't come in as naturally, but some of those sh shorter, scrappier tennis players, doubles players, w players that utilize their hands a lot in tennis and that have good quick twitch are going to be the players that transition really well into pickleball. The one thing that kind of tennis players miss is a little bit of the deception. Like if you look at speeding up at that kitchen line. So when you're close to each other at the net in pickleball, tennis players telegraph their shots a lot more than someone that doesn't come from tennis. So that'll be interesting as time goes on, 
you'll see a lot of the non-tennis players have more craftiness up there and we'll see how tennis players are able to combat that. Hmm. So as you, you climb the ladder, which, which you will, I don't think there's any doubt that you're going to be number one in the world. Um, kind of for you, those things, we kind of talked about it, but for you, like what, what truly, truly, what, what do you see are the most important attributes for somebody who uh, wants to achieve that? And really, it kind of translates into every part of life. If I want to be great at something, I have to be what? What is that for you um, to, to reach the highest level and that level of success? What, what do you think those characteristics are? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, it's pretty interesting. There's something so in pickleball, you call your own lines. And so one of the things that I think about a lot is like, you think of these top guys like a Kobe or like other players in other sports and it's that winning at all costs mindset, but there's that you have to like make, like be honest and have those like be fair on the line calls. And so it's finding that kind of line in pickleball where you're still not like so in the zone that you can't think about like anything. Like you want to be able to still look at the court and be like calm, but you also have to have that winning at all cost mindset outside of making your own lines. I mean, hopefully, they'll just have people calling lines in the future and then it makes it a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of tricky right now because you're in this winning at all costs mindset. You're like fighting on the court and then you also have to take a step back and be calm and look at the lines because it's pretty easy to be in that like you're wanting to win so bad. You're like, you could see things differently or you're having to focus on stuff. So definitely winning like that mindset of just being out there like, a David Goggins mindset. Like you need that to be one of the top guys in pickleball. You need to really spend the off court time very well. And so I would say those are the two things. And I would say the off court I'm still improving on, like the recovery, the going to the gym, the hours of film, like all of that stuff. If you're not doing that, that's why Ben is number one in the world right now, because he's putting in those hours of studying the game, doing all that stuff. And so that's really what I think it takes to be a staple at the top. Talk to me about um, if I just said, because I think a lot of young people today, this is just my view, and I coach for 33 years at a high level of college basketball, but I, I, see, I saw a lot of young people that talked about becoming great, but they just never really – either loved working at their game. You know, now we have all these words, you know, they're grinding and they're in the lab and they're working <laughs> on their craft. You know, we've articulated all this stuff. But, you know, for me, I'm kind of old school. It's just basically getting your butt in the gym or getting your butt wherever it is. You got to love it, but you got to work. So talk to me about how you view that. Just I'm just talking about just plain and simple work ethic. Yeah, I mean... I think two things, talk is cheap. I, that's one of my favorite things. Like it's easy for me to be on here and say what I need to do. Like the only person that's going to know if I do it is me when I go home, if I hop on and like turn on Netflix here in two hours, like all of what I said is for a waste. And so it's doing that when no one's looking, like that's what it comes down to. Like I almost like when I was playing tennis, I would, if I wasn't putting in the work off the court, like I am like when I'm on the court and there are coaches, like it's easy to work your butt off, but I would almost feel bad if I was like working hard when my coach is watching, if I knew that I wasn't working hard off the court. And I think that's just at the end of the day, if you're doing it like to get praised, like you're never going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be putting in more work where no one sees it. And then showing up, I think there's a quote where it's like work, work in silence and let your results do the talking. And I mm -hmm. think that, that at the end of the day, maybe I'll like, you guys won't know if I do that or not. The results will show, but that's kind of, if anyone wants to be great, that's what they got to do. Talk to me real quick about, or, or take as long as you want, but talk to me. If I just said to you the word, cause I think to be successful, mm -hmm. especially in sports, but anything in any walk of life, I think another part of it is resiliency. Like yeah. I think people, um, we all get beat. We all get knocked down. We all lose. That's a part of it, uh, although you never lost in high school, but you're <laughs> unique. But 
the ability to bounce back, resiliency. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there have been a few times where I have actually, and this is gonna be kind of random, but like Taylor Swift's whole situation, like I think that's a good case study for showing what resilience is. Like if you are the best at your craft, you can get hit and getting back up is more meaningful. Like if I get knocked down now and like, let's say I was in a final and I lost that final, if I didn't think I could be there again, that'd be, that'd be very detrimental. But if I have the inner belief that I can get back there, then it's just one more setback. And the more you can put in the work, like those setbacks are only going to make you hungrier. Do you, this is a question I used to get asked a lot, even when I coached, I played and coached, but they said, do you like winning more or do you hate losing less? Like which, which for you stings or, or which one motivates you more? Because some people, are, and I would tell you this about me, I loved winning. I mean, I loved winning. You know, I had teams go into Duke and win at, in Cameron or in Kentucky or North Carolina, but I hated losing. I hated it. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. I, and so for you, t t what do you think about that? Yeah, so I uh, hate losing. Uh, <laughs> there's like, it's funny, like the, the pickleball season or like a tennis season is long. And so you kind of go through ebbs and flows of how hungry you are, you are to win. And there are some tournaments where like, I am like, oh, like I'll have like a moment where I'm like, I, I don't know, like this match, like I'm not as motivated to win. And then any time that happens and I lose a match, like the next day I'm furious. Like I, I'm like, all right, that's gone. Like I start telling people like, oh, like, you know, I'm just here to have fun. And then soon as I lose, it's like, all right, F that. Like I am <laughs> in the back on the court. Like I can't have this happen again. So it's like, those losses are super key. Anytime you do feel like you're a little less motivated than 100%, that, the loss gets me right back. Killed me. It just killed me. Yeah. Matter of fact, it's 36 years ago. I was a senior in college, and we had a really good team in, at Alabama. I was playing, and we lost in the Sweet 16. Billy Donovan, who's the head coach of the Chicago Bulls, was um, played for Providence, and they beat us. And to this day, it's 36 years later, I, I, it just still bothers me. I, I just can't. There, there's that one, that loss just, it just gets at me still. And I can't do anything about that one. That one's <laughs> yeah. over. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So losing, I think sometimes is a, it's a motivator. It can be a motivator. I yeah. don't want to taste that again. I want to get better. I want to win. And yeah. I do want to win, but I, I just don't want to lose. And I'm not going to lose. And um, so I think probably for you, you had ups and downs. You said ebbs and flows. You had great wins. You probably had a couple that stung pretty bad. And each one of them might motivate you a little bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. And it's finding that kind of balance. I mean, I think that's the trickiest thing for me. It's the mentality of like, how do you stay locked in at that top level? And it all across all sports, it's that's something that's so hard. It's you can have a good tournament. You can get hot and win a tournament. But how do you stay at the top? It's it's easy to get to the top if you have enough talent. It's a lot harder to stay at the top. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the thing that you got to think about and mentally build up as you're continuing to progress in anything that you're doing. Well, I, I hope that uh, for you, number one, I, I'm a big fan now, so I appreciate you and uh, I'm rooting for you. Like I really am. I want to see you do well. I want to watch you, but um, I've enjoyed, um, you know, visiting today. I appreciate you coming on, but your competitive spirit, I said this early, I shook your hand and within 10 minutes, I said, this guy right here, he's a competitor. He wants to compete. And uh, I think that's what, in my view, that's what's going to carry you at some point to be in rank number one in the world. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, appreciate you having me on. It's been super awesome chatting and just, it's always interesting hearing different perspectives on this. I mean, coming from a different sport, you get other sides of it. And so it's always cool to hear those things and see the parallels and differences of it. It's super interesting. Well, thank you for uh, being on. You guys have been listening to The Front Row with uh, Coach Mark Godfrey. Thank you.